So welcome everybody to episode 127 today of Level Up, 60 minutes of live Q&A where your questions really do drive the show. Now Shanice and Ella are actually working on our social team today so they're in the chat so do please introduce yourself and of course let them know the city from where you are joining. We're going to post a link into the chat for you to be able to vote up the questions that you would most like answered and of course for you to add your own as well. Now if your question is selected your name will appear in the credits at the end of the show. So do get your questions in early and stay with us to see all of that happen. Today, we're going to be talking about how to become a change manager, a role which is often at the heart of successful business transformation in whatever guise that may take. Change management is a, I have to say, a peculiar blend of the art and the science appealing to professionals who really want to make use of the widest possible spectrum of their talents, from planning all of the way through designing amazing communications and, of course, engaging stakeholders, which is a fundamental part of the role. Managing change is often tricky, and I'm delighted today to be joined by a really experienced panel of experts who are here to answer your questions in real time. So let's jump in and meet them all. Sandy Lee joins us today. Sandy is a seasoned program and project manager whose work includes large-scale transformational programs, um, not just in the UK, but also across Europe and globally. Working closely with senior leadership teams, Sandra focuses on helping stakeholders with journey management. So welcome to Level Up, Sandy. Lovely to see you. Thank you, Nick, and delighted to be here. Um, yes, as Nick said, lots of experience working both globally and internationally um, uh, across Europe and in the UK, public and private sector. Um, and I think the exciting thing for me with change is it's always unique. No two experiences will be ever, the, ever be the same. So I'm really looking forward to sharing my experience with you all today. Absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Returning to the panel today is Diane, Diane Rampadareth, who's responsible for the implementation of the Agricultural Development Programme over in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Passionate about sustainable rural development, Diane is a regular contributor here on Level Up and um, a seasoned project and change manager as well. Welcome back to the panel, Diane. Lovely to see you today. Thank you very much, Nick and APMG International for the opportunity to be on the panel. As organizations prepare to function in a futures work environment, a lot of changes will be happening and therefore it emphasizes the need for organizations to have a dedicated change manager to effect the change. So I look forward to a very interesting show. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, Sam Jurawan is a director of the Change Managers Collective at Criteo, specialising in cultural change and stakeholder engagement. His work has taken him across industries and he has a particular interest, I think it's fair to say, in the Baltic region of Europe as well. So welcome back to Level Up, Sam. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much, Nick. It's great to be back with APMG Level Up in uh, 2023, my first panel for this year. Hopefully not the last. Um, and what a great topic to start off with, um, how to become a change manager, something that's really exciting. I think it's going to be great for the future as well and uh, looking forward to the questions and the answers. Absolutely right. Ron Lehman completes our panel for today. He's a regular online blogger, of course, and um, YouTuber as well. And as the founder of the Highway of Change, focuses on helping his clients really get to the heart of what good change management looks like um, without a lot of the periphery. A regular contributor <laughs> here on Level Up, Ron takes real interest in helping each of his clients reach their full potential. Welcome back to the panel, Ron. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much. It only seems like yesterday, well, it was nearly yesterday. It was a Friday. I was on the previous panel about collaboration. So it's good to be back. <laughs> I've had a weekend break in between. I'm ready to go. Change management. Yes, it's, it's the thing of the future, I think. And that's all I'm going to say. 
All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yes. Um, for regular viewers, we do move. All right. Although our backgrounds would suggest otherwise, we do actually get up and walk around and we do go and do other things at the weekends and so on. So very good. Now, on that note, um, let's introduce our question master for today, Sachitra Jacob, who joins us from Bangalore over in India. Um, I assume, Sachitra, that you did get up and go and do different things over at the weekend. <laughs> Hi, everyone. And yes, Nick, I think I did. <laughs> All right, okay. Well, very good. Well, look, we have uh, lots of folks joining us online, so it's really, really good. Uh, I can see uh, a number of people already who are in the chat who have introduced themselves. Um, so, uh, Vidyadar, thank you so much for joining uh, all the way from Mumbai. We have folks in Basingstoke in the UK. It's very close to me, actually, where I am here in the Thames Valley, just around the corner. And um, we've also got uh, Idara, um, who is joining from Abuja in Nigeria. So lovely to see you all online. Very good. Well, let's jump straight into the questions. If we can, Sachisha, let's take our first question, please. Sure. Our first question is from Miranda. How can I start a career in change management with little or no experience? All right, Ron, why don't you start us off on this one and then we'll hear from Sam. Uh, having been someone who fell into change management by accident, <laughs> I'm not really sure whether I'm the right person to ask, but um, I would say start with reading. Yeah, there's lots and lots of really good books out there that will give you a good flavor of what change management is. It'll start to give you an understanding of what it is you need to know, and it will help you make that decision. Yes, this is something I want to do. Um, if you're uh, working within an organization, try and get involved with some projects. Yeah? Try and volunteer as a an assistant of some sort so you get a feel for it. But what I would say is that... Um, you actually are probably involved in change anyway, in some way, shape or form. So maybe it's an idea to start thinking about what you're doing as change, because that will give you the real good idea of what change actually is. And then, of course, there's things like training and there's um, you know joining LinkedIn groups and stuff like that. So, yes, there's lots and lots of resources out there. All right. OK, it always starts with... Excuse me, a little bit of research, a little bit of personal research is a great jumping off point, as Ron says. Uh, Sam, your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, quite quite similar to Ron, actually. I, I never anticipated I would land in change management. I don't think a lot of people actually do. Um, it's one of the, it's not like you're a little kid dreaming, I'm going to be a change manager one day. It's not like one of those type of careers. Um, but how you can get into it with little experience, um, it's, it's, it's all about, if you have an interest in change management, as Ron said, you're likely doing things that are centered around managing change within your own remit, as in change management is huge in HR, it's huge in IT, it's huge in a lot of different aspects of business. So. To be fair, you're already doing uh, a little bit of change management regardless. And then I think the best place to start is to look towards uh, qualifications. And well, APMG's qualification is uh, is one that I recommend anyway as a, as a good starting point. So definitely, if you have that peaked interest and you want to pursue it further, look to get qualified and then you will start to see doors open from there. All right. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Great thoughts. Um, I want to come back to that concept of you know career guidance um, when we're at school or early career guidance in a few moments. Diane, your thoughts on how do you become a change manager? So you can start your, your career by doing a change management foundation course where you will learn the models and processes and methodologies of change management. Also, if you have a first degree in business management and you can continue further with a master's in business management, this can help us and forge your career path in change management. Yeah, I would agree um, with that, uh, Diane. The, um, I was just reflecting really on what Sam was saying a little bit earlier about you know career guidance. Often career guidance when we're young focuses on um, putting on a certain suit of clothes because that kind of characterization makes it easier for young people to be able to identify. So we've got, you know, Fireman Sam is very clear about what he does and, um, you, you know, people who are in the medical profession, it's very clear what they do. They do 
and you know because there's a certain uniform that goes with it and to be a change manager means being yourself <laughs> First and foremost, there is no suit of armor to put on as a change manager. You need to be your authentic self. So it's quite an interesting conundrum to be able to uh, kind of focus. Um, Sandy, you're very experienced in helping people, you know, think about how do they journey towards managing change. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, thank you, Nick. Yeah, I think one of the things for me is, first of all, think about some of the core skills that are going to be really important for change. Um, there are some obvious areas in things like getting an understanding of organisation design or development or getting involved in facilitating uh, events, so getting some facilitation skills, building your communication skills. I think in my career it may sound obvious, but actually becoming an effective communicator and understanding what that means for different people um, is going to be core. And I think the last thing for me from a change perspective um, is you must be passionate about business, how business works for whatever industry you're in or whatever area. Um, change isn't something that we kind of tack on as an afterthought. It means getting involved in understanding what matters in your business and matters for all the different stakeholders in it, whether it's the customers of your business or the people delivering the services and products. Um, and if you're passionate about that, then actually um, then change will start to come naturally in thinking about what will work in that environment. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And I think that passion absolutely shines through, doesn't it? I, um, I can't remember who said this originally, but somebody did say that, you know, if you find what you're passionate about in life and you do it uh, for a living, you never work another day in your life because it's not really work. <laughs> All right. Very good. Vitor, thank you so much for joining us from Oxford, known as the City of Spires in the UK, very beautiful um, university city, of course. Um, and Dami, thank you so much for joining from Nigeria. Uh, really great to have you um, online today and looking forward to some questions from West Africa to come through from you, Amadi as well. Um, really nice to have you online. Thank you for joining my friend from Northampton in the centre of the UK. Um, a great place to be and um, a huge amount of work actually um, is available uh, there and in that region, really busy region of the UK. And um, of course, yeah, Helen, good point. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Helen. Here's a book recommendation from somebody who's not on the APMG team directly, but she's talking about the Change Management Handbook. It's a super useful resource. And of course, the, the membership body themselves who are very closely associated with APMG, the Change Management Institute. They're based in Australia, I think, from memory, um, but they have um, groups and sections all over the world for you to join and tap into. So really good. Thank you very much, um, folks online, for those suggestions. Really brilliant. Keep them coming in. So let's move on, Suchitra, if we can, and we'll take our next question, please. We have a question from Cindy. How important is reflective listening as a skill to become a successful change manager? Okay, very good. Um, Diane, why don't you start us off, please? Listening as a skill for change manager is very important. And even more so important is that of reflective listening, where you actually reflect back to the person what is your understanding of what they said. So this would reduce any type of miscommunication, misinterpretation. So the better you are at listening, the better you are at understanding so that you can effect change. Yeah, I think you're so right. It, it's, it's an indicator, isn't it, all of the time of that we are actively listening. You know, so much when we're early career, we're trying to form what we're about to say next <laughs> in our brains instead of really listening to the person in front of us. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Sandy, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Sam. Yes, thank you. Building on what Deanne said, um, reflective listening is is crucial for me as a skill. Um, as change managers, we are trying to facilitate and bring people with us and people will be motivated by different things. And therefore, it's really important that not only we understand those different things, but we have checked in and confirmed that we've, we've forced clarity um, in, in amongst ambiguity. And that's really important because um, as change managers, we need to overcome obstacles. And we can only do that if we've got that understanding of what they really are. 
So for me, really important reflective listening. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? To force clarity out of ambiguity. That's a, that's a lovely phrase. I'm going to make a note of that one. Thank you so much, um, Sandy. That's super helpful. Sam, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Ron. Yeah, definitely. It's um, Reflective listening is a hugely important skill um, for the individual side of change management, but I think it can even be reflected onto the overall organization when we think about how companies are starting to think about how they're positioning their future initiatives. And if you can get to a point where you have a dialogue with your, with your, with your team, with your workforce, with your employees, where you're taking on what they're saying as the direction and, uh, and, and, and what they need more, and you're responding back to them by saying, we've heard you, and now we're doing something more with that, you're effectively taking reflective listening onto a whole new level, and you're able to cater for a, a whole different group of people. So reflective listening is, is hugely powerful, not just for the individual, but for the whole business as well. Yeah, thank you very much. You did. I, I totally agree with that because people need to see evidence of their input appearing, all right, to evolve that and to own that change that's going through the business. Otherwise, it becomes something which is almost arm, arm's length, you know, from individuals and teams. And we'll talk a little bit more later on about the uh, informal social network that is in organizations. I think we'll touch on that. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Um, now, if you're online, everybody, then please do give us your suggestions as well. How would you answer this question? Just type it into the chat. How important is reflective listening um, to you, our online audience? Please do let us know. Um, Ron, your thoughts on reflective listening, please. Uh, yeah, just to go back to Friday's is a session on collaboration, we had a, a conversation about chat GPT and I cheated slightly. So what I did was I actually put this question about reflective listening into chat GPT. And what it came back with, it said, reflective listening is very important for a change manager to become sexful, successful. It helps the change manager to understand the perspective of the stakeholders and shows empathy towards their concerns. By actively listening mm. and understanding the needs of stakeholders, a change manager can effectively address their resistance to change and build support for the change initiative. Um, there are a lot of issues around chat GPT in the, in the learning space, but I just thought it'd be interesting to just have a look and see what it came back with as an answer. And uh, it is relatively generic, but it's still quite good. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's a fantastic tool to be able to use, to add to the toolkit, you know, that we'll have available to us. The key word out of all of that, for me, was empathy. If you can yeah. demonstrate yeah. empathy in, you know, your listening and responding, then you're able to show um, in a much deeper fashion that you're taking on board people's um, concerns, their issues, their their current situation, if you like, and planning in reality how that might um, transform in the coming days and months as the change program actually rolls out. So empathetic approach is very important indeed as to how we go about things. So excellent. Thank you very much indeed, panel. Well, Suchitra, I can see that the questions are really stacking up, so I think we better move on. Let's take our next question, please. We have a live question from Matthew Wade from LinkedIn. I fell into a CM role after years of agile delivery and BA. My question would be, in terms of progression for a change manager, what's next? Where can I go from there? Okay, Sandy, why don't you start us off, please? Okay, well, I mean, the first thing I'd say is you've got a great skill set there, having business analyst skills. So you're thinking about um, business problems, what, what we need in, in business. And agile delivery, obviously, is really a complementary uh, PM tool for helping us think about how can we adapt quickly. I mean, the whole agile movement was about not getting tied down in red tape, but making sure we could be responsive and evolutionary in our focus on change. Um, for me, that brings it, gives you a, uh, it puts you in a lovely position 
discussion to think about actually extending your skill set, maybe even to project and program management, because it's all about scale and complexity. As we know, no two changes are the same. So there's a real opportunity to get involved in thinking about how you deliver programs of change and perhaps bringing those two skills you all ha- you already have as a core base um, and getting involved in actually delivery of large scale change programs. I'd certainly like to echo that. Some of the most insightful individuals I know have spent time as business analysts working in organisations because you perfect your 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 way to kind of peel back the layers, if you like, to kind of almost peel back those layers of the onion to get to the heart of the matter as a business as a business analyst. So fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Sandy. Sam, your thoughts, how could you help out uh, Matthew as to where he goes from here? Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I just want to echo as well. I, th- I think that Matthew has a, a hugely diverse set of skills. Uh, I, I'm quite jealous. Um, uh, I think it's one of those. Uh, <laughs> I think it's. I, I think it's one of those things where when you get into change management, you and after you've been doing it for a few years, you do feel a little bit locked away, and uh, you start to wonder, okay, where's the natural progression step from where I am right now? But the best way to kind of think about it is as a change manager, usually so transversal around the business, you have the best opportunity to see what you like from each different aspect of, uh, of a company. Um, and that gives you one connections within different departments and with different people, but also it tells you what is your next move. So I've met a lot of change managers who have worked with IT teams and Scrum and Agile, and it just wasn't for them. Uh, but then they went over to the financial side or the legal side of change and they were like, wow, this is actually something I'm really interested in and I want to specialize in that. So I think in terms of a change manager, the best thing about it is that you're so transversal, you can really go to anywhere that you really want to. And Matthew, you have such a diverse set of skills, I'm sure you're going to be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, let's hear from Diane and then Matthew, I'll share some thoughts with you myself. So as Sandy and Sam said, Matthew already has a wide range of core competencies and skills which can help him in his change management uh, function. But you can also look at pursuing certification courses as a change management professional or change management specialist, which can also assist you to further develop in the change management field. Yeah, thank you very much, Diane. I, I, I think you're right. I think, Matthew, you know, you've know, you got a fantastic foundation on which to build a career in change management and beyond. There are a couple of thoughts for you. One is that um, I would really invest in facilitation skills. Change management is often about trying to help people accept change rather than necessarily trying to sell the change to anybody. And so facilitation skills become increasingly important. The higher the stakes of the change transformation, the more likely it is that you're going to need a wider variety of facilitation skills in order to be able to deliver as a change manager. So that is one area that I would really recommend to you. Um, And the other one that I would recommend is to start considering um, different methods of communication and and in communication coaching. Often the C-suite, the most senior leaders of organizations, um, don't always, they don't always connect with the different communities and the stakeholders that you have mapped out on their behalf. So Having the ability to coach others in improving their communication style and skills is a really, really important aspect, and that will give you the authority, if you like that presence, to be able to hold uh, the C-suite and add even more value than you are currently doing. But what a fantastic um, question. So thank you so much, Matthew, for uh, putting that in. Now, if you're on LinkedIn yourself, as many of you are, or you're on YouTube, then do just type your question into the chat and we will pick it up and bring it into the show. Really good to see you, Alan, joining us from a rather cold Glasgow up in Scotland this morning. For those of you who are in 
Nigeria, it's a very different temperature range than we have in the UK at the moment. So I really, a uh, big shout out to you in Glasgow. Also, we have uh, Faith joining us as an AI engineer. Faith, we might be tapping into um, your experience soon on Level Up. It'd be great if you could join us for a panel talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence and so on. That would be absolutely fabulous, wouldn't it? And Daniel, of course, joining us from the northeastern corner, actually, of Nigeria, which is an area I must admit I've never travelled to. So I have been to Nigeria a few times, but not actually to the northeast of the country. And Marion is a colleague over in the Netherlands, just to the east of Amsterdam, in the very beautiful city of Housen. Excellent. Let's move on, if we can, please, panel, and we'll take our next question. We have a question from one of our viewers who wants to know, many organizations just use a project manager to also do change management work during project delivery. How practical is this in terms of capacity and capability? All right, excellent. I think pretty much everybody on the panel is going to jump in on this one. Ron, why don't you start us off and then we'll hear from Sam. As one of my favourite subjects, PM versus CM, um, having delivered about 30 sessions to PMI chapters. Um, it's a difficult one um, because obviously the, the profession of PM has grown over the years, and the PM book, PM book 7 now from the PMI is about 400 pages long. Um, and obviously, the profession of CM has grown over the years, um, and we are now a profession on our own, obviously. Um, so in terms of delivering projects by a PM only, there's the issue of um, the project size, the project impact, et cetera, and how much time a project manager can actually give um, to the project in terms of change management capability and capacity. Yeah, because you know, through many surveys, through many um, um, research, it's always been shown that change management is actually critical to project success. So there's always this issue of how best to integrate the two. Sometimes you can get away with a project manager with some change management skills. Sometimes you can not get away with that, but you do need a separate project manager and a separate change manager. And again, what, what, I, uh, what I mentioned earlier, it's all about project size, project impact. It's even about whether there's a budget for project uh, change management. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Ron. All about scope, scale, and of course, it all boils down to money and effort. Sam, your thoughts, and then we'll hear from Sandy. Yeah, I think this is this is a very uh, common question about uh, the fact that well, well, project management has technically been around a lot longer than change management if we're talking about the, as a as a professional body, a professional role, but. I believe that they have two completely different skill sets. I, I've been a PM before as well, and uh, uh, and and it's a completely different role in terms of what you're actually trying to achieve. And I think, in practical terms of uh, of capability, it's quite it, it is definitely possible to switch between the two. But you really want to try and dedicate people to just focusing on what their speciality or what their key set of skills are. Um, and for a PM and a CM to work together, you can really unlock a lot of potential uh, to deliver more successful change initiatives. And, and companies like PwC and IBM, and they've done a lot of studies, and they're massive advocates on the direct function of CM being separated from PM and how effective it is for them actually managing change within their organizations. So as in, in terms of capability, definitely there's one. In terms of capacity, it's all going to depend on the project and, and, and what the current portfolio looks like. Thanks very much indeed, Sam. Sandy, in your experience, how would you answer the question? Yes, yeah, so I think one of the most important things is uh, thinking about starting with the end in mind. Um, and it's a difference to me in terms of project management and change management. One focuses arguably a bit more on outputs and the change management is more on the outcomes, making sure that 
you know, we can deliver a working system from a project perspective, but whether or not people can work with that system in that business um, comes down to focusing on interactions of people. Um, so for me, it's really about um, being very clear whether, you know, that PM and a CM have to work very synergistically. But the other point I would say is change doesn't belong to any one role. And for me, the key is therefore that you need a really good cascading model of sponsorship. You need all of your change advocates thought about, so a change network. Um, and for me, that's all about the change management role thinks about um, how can we make sure all of those stakeholders are working in an integrated way together to deliver the overall change outcomes. Otherwise, there is a danger. I actually had a project once where at the end of it, and it was a catastrophic failure. I'd gone in to do a, um, an audit for the board. And um, at the end of it, um, one of the lead architects said, I don't understand why this failed. Our system worked. But the problem was the people in the organization couldn't work with the system. So, mm, so that's for me is, is where the focus needs to be. Okay, thank you very much. Really good point, isn't it? The PM uh, prepares the solution for um, uh, the project and the CM often prepares the organization for the solution. So those kind of two things very much work hand in hand. Thank you very much. Uh, Diane, your thoughts on this, please? So a PM and a CM both in their respective roles when they implement projects or initiatives add long-term value creation to the organization. And in some instances, a PM and a CM work with the same team of persons to communicate and to look and see how change would impact on stakeholders and your organizations. So there might be an overlay in terms of the functions of both a PM and a CM. So one can work in another's function. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think there's um, the very best project managers have an element of um, change management experience about them and vice versa as well. You know, you do need to be able to under understand the primary responsibilities of each of the two roles. Now, they are roles. And so therefore, sometimes what you'll have is somebody that's leading on change management also working in another role on the project, but not necessarily as the PM. I, I would suggest strongly that you know the CM is better aligned if it's a part-time uh, role on a project, that they're better actually um, aligned with some of the other tasks, not necessarily being the PM. All right, so it's just a thought for you. Um, I want to take you back to 1829. Now, before um, I actually kind of share this story with you, I want to assure everybody who's online was I was not present to witness this firsthand. However, right, 1829 um, was a competition, okay? And it was when uh, Stevenson's rocket, the steam engine, was first run, and it, run, it won, rather, the competition, the trials, to become the first locomotive to connect the cities of Liverpool and Manchester. It's about 40 miles apart or so. The point was, um, during those competitions, actually, um, one of the spectators was run over and killed. All right, tragically. Um, I would argue that the project manager had delivered the project, okay, but it was the change management community that convinced passengers to get on, all right, after that happened and to take that service. So project management and change management are related, but absolutely not the same. And I would strongly um, recommend to organizations that you consider a part-time change management role as being resourced from somebody else on the project rather than overloading your PM. All right, very good. Great question, and thank you for putting it in. So, Chitra, let's move on if we can, and we'll take our next question, please. Our next question is from Vanessa. Change managers always seem to fall prey to budget cuts. How can I help people understand the importance of change management? <laughs> well, there we are. It's often linked to benefits realization, ultimately, the adoption of solutions into organizations. And so um, these are often things which on the tick list that uh, organizations have to set up and run projects about delivering the project on time and on budget and so on, they tend to overlook when is it that the benefits are going to be realized. And so therefore, it's all about thinking, how do you get benefits realization further up 
the uh, hierarchy of importance. Ron, start us off, and then we'll hear from Sandy. Yeah. Funnily enough, um, I have just answered this question on my YouTube channel. Um, it's video 60, I think it is. And one of the things I said is it is all about benefits realisation. It's all about being able to measure what you're doing, what a change manager is doing. And that kind of um, helps with people understanding the importance. The other thing is there is nothing more visual than being able to get change management activities onto a master project plan because those master project plans are viewed by senior managers, et cetera. And if they see change management activities on there, then they will consider that as an important issue. Uh, very quickly, can I just go back to, about the alignment of change management and project management? One of the problems is that once a project is finished, the project manager has delivered to scope, quality, budget, et cetera, and they start to look for their own they're another project, whereas change managers are always involved in benefits realization, in sustainability, in reinforcement, etc. So there is that lack of alignment. But going back to what I said, the importance is visibility. It's absolutely um, being able to measure your change management activities and getting visibility for them. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Sandy, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, building on what Ron said there, I mean, obviously, um, when when people invest in change programs, as, as uh, you said right at the outset, Nick, there's an intention to get at see a return. And obviously, that um, it, the, the space between that initial vision and intent of, of getting uh, benefits, um, the space of actually implementing the change means loads of risk can happen. So I think one of the key ways people can understand the change management is to be highlighting the obstacles. So change managers not only have the job of trying to support fast adoption and remove obstacles, but actually um, make sure that senior leaders and key stakeholders understand the risks to the benefits they're actually trying to achieve. And that normally then you can use that to then demonstrate a path, a structured path through that minimizes that risk. And I think that's a key aspect of the change management role is looking for those things. They may be psychological risks, emotional ones, physical, cognitive ones, but there'll be lots of um, motivational issues that may impact someone's ability to change. And it's highlighting those risks and presenting structured solutions to support uh, the implementation of change. So important to be able to do that. And often you're, you are, as a change manager, you're in a unique position, I would say, to speak truth to power. So very, very important that you do do that. Thank you so much. Uh, Diane, final thoughts on this? So the world and organizations are constantly undergoing change. And unless you adapt and change, your very existence or sustainability and your competitive advantage would be jeopardized or even threatened. So therefore, change is important for any organization to innovate, to adapt, to develop better skills. And therefore, the importance of change management is emphasized for sustainability. With regard to budget cuts, if you can also show that you have cost control measures uh, with regard to your budget and you can track your spending and your costs, you can also justify and reduce the chances of your budgets being cut. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Now, it will vary from organisation to organisation, but right now, I think you're, you're right, um, Vanessa, to call out that people are under pressure for, to deliver you know, better value. OK, from the work that is going on around the world, you know, there are, we have inflationary pressures, we have, you know, costs rising in organisations, whether you're in the private or the public sector. Um, it doesn't really matter. The end game is the same. How do we deliver best value out of the work that we are doing? But best value doesn't always mean the lowest price. Um, it can also mean that you manage and mitigate risk to an organisation. If you're changing the way in which people are paid in the public sector, and you have a large number of individuals who are going to be impacted by that change, I would suggest you would be super careful 
about doing that. All right. So it's about thinking, as the panel of suggests have said, what are the risks involved in this? How high are the stakes that are involved in this? And I can assure you, once you've managed those risks, afterwards, people will see the value. All right. If you don't manage them, well, that's a different matter. So don't sit on your hands, metaphorically, do speak up. Now, we have a huge number of people online today who are following us, which is fantastic to see, but you are a little quiet. So I'm just going to invite you now to comment in the chat, please, on this question. You know, we have a lot of budgetary pressures. How is your organization responding? Are you really looking at value or are you really looking at price? So just type those two words into the chat. Are you a value-driven organization? Do you champion best value in your organization? Or are you falling prey to the, it's got to be the cheapest all of the time? So that's my question to you, the audience on this particular episode. Please do type those words into the chat and let us know your thinking. Is value best? Or is it best to accept that we're going to go down the cheapest possible route? All right, very good. Now, while you're doing that, we're going to move on. So, Chitra, let's take our next question, please. We have a question from another viewer who asks, is there a necessity to develop a knowledge of neuroscience and change psychology or change managers wanting to go that extra mile? Okay, uh, Diane, start us off and then we'll hear from Sandy. So having core competencies and skills in any area that contributes to change management will always ensure that your project is successfully implemented. So neuroscience looks at how your brain functions, how your brain reacts, and probably encourages or promotes resistance. So in having a better understanding of neuroscience, you can understand how to address resistant change situations. And change psychology also looks at how people react to change and what makes them change. So having more information and knowledge can always help your change initiative. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Sandy, your thoughts and then Ron. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, building on what Deanne said there, in my view, you don't need to be an expert in neuroscience or uh, change psychology, but however, to have no interest in it would equally be a massive gap. Um, for me, change is all about uh, pulling change into organisations, not pushing it onto them. And therefore, you need to get into what will motivate individual. For organisational change to be successful, it must be connected to individual change. Um, it's much easier to do it if you can bring people with you than trying to force water uphill. So from my perspective, it's absolutely important to think about what are the cognitive, the emotional, the psychological, or even physical uh, changes that people may need to go through. So you can understand resistance better and work with it because better to understand it, forearmed is forewarned, um, and then help to guide people through uh, that change journey. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're so right there, Sandy. Spot on. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Ron, your thoughts, please, and then we'll hear from Sam. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you know that we have three active brains? We have our head, we have our heart, and we have our gut. Those are connected by a thing called the vagus nerve. And 90% of the information that goes through the vagus nerve goes up and only 10% goes down. So you know where the phrase gut reaction comes from, okay? Obviously, it's very quick. Yeah, You make a gut reaction, it goes up to your heart, it goes up to your brain, and then you eventually make a decision. So um, I think, as Sandy said, it's important to know about neuroscience, but not to be an expert. There's, there's an interesting article I published, or I, I shared on LinkedIn the other day, where the latest research has said that the microbes that reside in your gut impact the way your brain works. And this is new research. So we are starting to look at a whole different, um, a different aspect of the way the brain works. So we need to keep on top of understanding the, the impact that that has because the brain is the prime mover. Only 10% of your brain is active. 90% of your brain does all of your, your uh, sort of nat normal stuff that you do as a matter of course, whereas the prefrontal cortex 
is only 10%, and that's where you do all your rational thinking and making decisions. So you have to know this information, but not be an expert at it. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. I think Sorry we've got a whole. That. I think we've got a. That's all right. No, no. We, I think we've got a whole episode kind of in there somewhere. Sam, rescue me <laughs> from my own incompetence as I as I as I struggled there a little bit I, to kind of. Uh, I, I, yeah, I felt very inferior when uh, Ron was speaking. He's uh, clearly an expert in this, but um, <laughs> I'm going to give a more <laughs> humble answer. Uh, I think uh, I think that if we're looking at this word uh, necessary to develop knowledge, uh, I wouldn't go that far to say it's absolutely necessary. Um, I would think that where change management sits right now in terms of uh, a profession, an industry, uh, uh, a standalone, I think it's more important than the necess- uh, necessary things that being communication, facilitation, stakeholder management, those key basics. I think this is a nice to have. And if you're really into managing change on an individual level, so as in you're dealing with change um, more on a smaller scale or the change is very, very uh, intricate for different people, uh, I think neuroscience and change psychology can be useful. But um, but I would really focus on the change fundamentals before going into anything like neuroscience or change psychology. Thank you very much. And and I think what, what what's interesting about this is the the way in which thank you very much the way in which um, we become change managers. Some folks are becoming change specialists early in their career, and that's one thing. Others are actually coming, as Helen's kind of pointing out in the chat, to this after being highly experienced in other disciplines, related disciplines, and they become more and more interested in it and so on and so on. And so it is a great extension skill, all right? And the key element to the question there actually was, you know, for them to go that extra mile, if you like, to be able to extend yourself as a change manager, um, which is quite possibly, Helen, um, the theme for a show later on in this series um, as we get... uh, uh, towards May, I think it is. I think it might be in the May um, listings. Uh, So do watch out for that. Anybody who's online today, we have a lot of folks who are looking for the more advanced level of conversations around change management. We will be getting into those a little bit later on in the year. So thank you very much indeed for that suggestion um, about the book from Hilary Scarlett. Excellent. Thanks, Helen. Now, um, the question that I posed a little earlier to the audience was quite fascinating. I was asking, you know, do you work for an organization which is value driven? And thank you for Shanice, to Shanice in the social team for posting that online. Or are, is your organization really driven by price? So here are some of the answers um, that we got back from the folks who were online. Um, Helen's firmly in value, as you might expect from her earlier book recommendation. So thank you very much indeed, Helen. She even added the exclamation mark at the end there to make the point. And um, she is also being supported there by uh, Jabalili. Um, who is also saying that her organization is value driven. And that sounds fantastic, uh, Jabalili. So thank you for letting me know that. Thought Nation, thank you so much. A regular um, viewer on Level Up, value driven as well. I wonder if there was anybody that was kind of round the other. <laughs> <laughs> the other way, endlessly. <laughs> very honest, very honest. Thank you so much. All right. Because even though we might like to think that way, sometimes, you know, the behavior that we can observe is contradictory, um, you know, to, uh, to, to being value driven. And um, Matthew is saying uh, often the conundrum that the consultancy, all right, is value driven, but the client often is more price sensitive okay and that can happen can't it you know not everybody would will accept the pitch deck for what they might call the rolls royce solution and they often prefer the bicycle with or without the bell sometimes so it can be a tough world as a consultant but look excellent thank you very much indeed audience for um sharing your thoughts on value versus price let's move on suchitra if we can we've got a couple of Questions, I think, that we can still fit in before we finish. So let's go ahead. We have another live question from Marina, who wants to know if the panelists can tell her about how they became a change manager. 
Yes, of course, we'd be delighted to do that. <laughs> Can we try and keep it short, though, please, panel? All right. So, Sam, why don't you start us off, then we'll hear from Ron. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier. Uh, a lot of people fall into the change management profession. Uh, it's exactly the same with me. Um, before, I was working as a business analyst and... Uh, and, and again, I was uh, very happy with my, you know, my Excel, my SQL. I was very, very, very content uh, with that being very siloed uh, along with my technology. Uh, and uh, I was presented with an opportunity to uh, go and travel and live in Lithuania to open an office as a change manager. And my first response to them was, uh, what, what is a change manager? I don't know what that is. Uh, so again, that's, uh, that was my first interaction which changed many years ago, um, and uh, and I took the opportunity, and I and I fell in love with the profession and, and what it kind of stands for, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. So that's how I became. It's interesting, isn't it, how influential managers can be sometimes. Somebody clearly saw this talent, all right, uh, in you, and um, made this suggestion, and I'm really pleased for you that they did because it's worked out so very well. I think you make an amazing contribution to the change community. So thank you very much indeed um, for that, Sam. Um, Ron, your thoughts, please. Then we'll hear from Sandy. Uh, very, very difficult to keep this short, but way back in 19... Blah, 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 I um, was working for the Ministry of Defence and I attended a course called Work Study, um, which was partly method study and partly work measurement which is obviously looking at how people work, measuring how long it took, and then changing their processes, et cetera, and then remeasuring it to see how more efficient it was. Effectively, that was all about change management. Okay, So from there, I carried on working for the MOD. I then left the MOD, started with a bank, and it wasn't called change management then because change management really only came into the sort of um, the site of people in the 1990s and 2000s. But I worked in a profit improvement, um, process improvement, uh, et cetera, you name it, all change management. I then went on the contract market and I was working for what was then the Bank of Scotland and they would look at it was as a, as a process analyst and um, they were then saying, how do we implement this uh, back, office, back office system? And all of a sudden I became a change manager. So <laughs> it was like, you know, we have, to develop, we have to develop some kind of implementation process. So, you know, how, how does it impact people, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, that's a good idea. I'm now a change manager and have been ever since. <laughs> okay, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Interesting journeys, these so far, aren't they? Okay, Sandy, your thoughts on this, please. Uh, how did you become a change manager? And then we'll hear from Diane. Well, originally I started out as an HR graduate on a two-year program like many people uh, do, and I got some developed core skills and things like organisation development, design, um, employee relations, things that uh, got me involved with trade unions and managing resistance and, and working with and collaborating. Um, I was lucky enough that that got me into doing a couple of mergers and acquisitions, which required me to be really at the business end of what those businesses were there to do to actually harmonise and, and try and uh, make those uh, organizations work you know really well when they were integrated and because of that that commercial business interest drove me into consulting and so in consulting then I, I moved worked in the city for sort of 12 years and really honed first project management skills but actually then really built up that base um, and the beauty of building having an HR background then combined um, with the kind of project management background it gave me kind of on the one hand a really output you know outcome focused delivering to a goal and a timeline but that whole HR focus reminded me that things are never black and white and you're work, you've got to be able to work with uncertainty um, and support people to, to navigate that. So that's kind of there how I developed my journey and went on uh, to, to do large scale transformation programs and projects. I, th I think you make a really, really good point there. Um, it's about that, you know, being willing and how, how much of an appetite do you have to live with uncertainty? Because the role of the mm -hmm. change manager actually is one of the most exposed positions to be able to have. You have all of the problems and very few answers quite often, okay, at the beginning of the process. They tend to come and, and be revealed as time progresses. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, really great to know that as well. Wonderful background. Uh, Diane, how did you 
become a change manager. To give my involvement in the implementation of programs and projects, you start with an initial project concept and an outcome, but there's so many activities in between to achieve your mandate and so many changes occurred. So I became interested in change management, did a few courses and used my knowledge to implement successful change management projects. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, and what an amazing set of backgrounds. I, I think we might do that. We might, we might do some one-to-one -one interviews, actually, to kind of find people's professional careers and these sorts of things and put them actually up on our um, website so that you can learn a little bit more about the background of the various panellists. What a great idea. So thank you so much, Marina, for a fabulous question um, put into the panel. We're going to have to scurry uh, panel. We're going to have to go lightning fast. Let's take our last question, if we may, Sachita. We'll just squeeze this one in. We have a last question from Wondimu on LinkedIn. What could be the most difficult challenge in change management? All right. One thing each, please, panel, Diane, and then Sam. So organizations functioning in our future's work environment, there's so many changes which impact the work that's being done, who is doing the work, when and where the work are being undertaken. So being able to address all those issues using your change management methodologies can become a challenge. All right. Thank you so much. Sam, one thing from you, please. Yeah, uh, I think the biggest challenge is also the the crux of change management success is, is uh, sponsorship. Um, and without sponsorship, change can't take place or can't take root within an organization very well. And it is always a challenge to ensure that your key stakeholders and your key sponsors are engaged with change activities um, as they are more engaged with the project side of things. Um, and that's a huge challenge in change management. All right, thank you so much. And Ron, your thoughts? Um, I think one of the biggest problems is lack of transparency and um, honest and timely communication. Um, there are many instances, certainly where I've worked before, where individuals have been less than honest and they have um, decided not to put out the full communication that they wanted to in the first place or they put out communication which obviously um, has gaps so lack of transparency and honest and timely communication are two of the biggest challenges i believe all right okay thank you very much indeed thank you panel and um, apologies one demo we've just kind of running out of time but a fantastic question on which to end the show. So um, let's hear from our panel on their reflections on today's event. Um, so your kind of final thoughts for me, please. Let's start off with Sandy and then we'll go to Ron. Okay, well, thank you. I've certainly lost, learned a lot from the great questions and from the answers of my colleagues today. Um, I think one of the things for me, I think it was Her Heraclitus that said in 500 BC, he was a Greek philosopher and said, um, there is nothing permanent except change. And I mean, that's still true today. So it certainly um, stood the test of time, which I think demonstrates it's a profession um, that's not going to go away. Organisations will keep needing to adapt, keep needing to change. Um, and therefore, I think there's a wealth of opportunities out there and I think um, there were many quotes I could have chosen today but one I really enjoyed when I was uh, thinking about it was one that came from a presenter Oprah Winfrey who said the greatest discovery of all time is that a person can change their future merely by changing their attitude and I think that's the challenge for us as change managers to help them to do that. They, there you go only on level up would you connect Heracles with Oprah Winfrey. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed, Sandy. Uh, Ron, your thoughts, please, and then we'll hear from Sam. Yeah. What can I say? Another great uh, level up session, like it was on um, Friday, the collaboration session. Really, really good questions. Had to get this thought process going here a little bit. Um, and I particularly like the question about how did you become a change manager? Because it was so varied, it was unbelievable um, how, how people's fall into the profession not all people do but a lot of people actually do because change is change you are involved in change all the time and if you are 
inside a change manager, you can recognize that and you can say, I want to become a change manager. So hopefully our panel here and the answers we've given have given you a lot of food for thought. Thank you so much indeed. I'm sure that they absolutely have. Sam, your thoughts, please, and then Diane. Yeah, uh, for me, great panel, great answers, great questions. Uh, it's always great to be back with APNG uh, Level Up. And, and and I don't have any inspirational quotes like Sandy, unfortunately. Uh, I am not that well prepared, but definitely I'm hoping that everyone who's uh, who's joined us for the panel can see that uh, change management is uh, part of the uh, a big future and uh, and definitely watch this space. Yeah, most definitely true. Thank you so much, um, Diane, and then Sajitra. So as always, a very interesting show with a lot of very interesting questions. And I was learning a lot from my fellow panelists. And today, Sandy would have provided a quote on forced clarity from ambiguity. So to me, that's the very essence where you have no misinterpretation, no miscommunication, so that you can have a successful change management initiative. Thank you. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. That's one of several that I've written down myself. Um, Suchitra, final thoughts today? I enjoyed today's show, Nick, and thank you to our panelists for your amazing answers. And special shout out to our viewers for your active participation and uh, book recommendations and your amazing questions. Thank you. I know it's been an incredibly busy time actually over in the chat. So thank you very much, everybody. You are the producers of the show. Your questions are what drive the show throughout. So really great job. Do watch out for your name in the credits, of course, if your question was selected. Um, so well done, everybody. Over on our website now, of course, you can search for answers to more than 1,500 questions. It's a comprehensive resource that connects you with over 170 experts from around the world. Don't forget, you can listen to the audio versions of all of the shows on your preferred podcast platform. Just search for Level Up Your Career with APMG International. Take a moment, please, to like, comment, share, and subscribe um, to our YouTube channel. It doesn't cost you anything, and it really does help other people discover the content and level up their careers. Looking forward this Friday at 2 p.m. GMT, is the first of our February shows where we discuss breaking into the world of NIST cybersecurity. And then next Monday, we come back to the culture side of life, looking at specifically at about how do you grow a culture of inclusivity across your organization. So join us for those. All next week, by the way, is the World Business Relationship Management Week or BRM Week. And you can find out more about the timetable for those events over on our website. Subscribe to the show and we'll send you a personal summary of what's coming up and how you too can join us here on the panel and level up your career with APMG. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you next time.